Uh, kia ora and welcome. And look, thanks for spending the next hour with us as we talk about, I suppose, uh, life as a general practitioner and the GP training program. So I'm uh, Brian Betty. I'm Medical Director of the Royal New Zealand College of General Practitioners. Um, I'm also a general practitioner in Cannons Creek in East Pararua and Wellington, have been for a number of years. Um, with me today, we've got a, a lineup of GPs just to talk about their experience in general practice and some of the aspects of training, what's required to become a general practitioner in New Zealand. So Vanessa Prescott is a fellow of the college. She's based in Auckland, a member of the Pacific chapter, and has an interest in youth health. Um, we'll have May Davis, David, sorry, May, um, who's a GP registrar, GP3. And I think May's very interesting uh, spin on things as she was doing paediatrics and has decided to move to general practice, which is fantastic. Um, Stephen Lillis is a GP in Hamilton. He's chair, he, he's basically the clinical lead for the program. And I'm talking a little bit of depth about what's required in the program, how it's structured and, and the academic side of what actually goes on in the three year program. And we have Melissa Austin, who's with me, who's a GP registrar who's four weeks out from full qualification, which is fantastic, um, based in Corey and Wellington. Um, and we have Rachel Rogers, who's um, manages um, Registrar support and advice and is going to talk about some of those, those admission type issues that, that, that happen with the program, which I, I think will be of interest. Um, so look, just a couple of housekeeping things. Please mute your mics if you're listening to this. Um, there'll be time for question and answers, hopefully at the end, and use the Q&A function for that, and we'll try and answer your questions as we can. Um, so anything we can't answer, we will put up or, or, or put up later on and make sure those questions are answered. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so it can be looked at later on, um, and we'll forward the link for the attendees later on um, after, after the seminar's finished. Okay, so who is the College of GPs? Well, look, put it simply, um, we have over 5,500 members. Um, that is um, specialist GPs, um, associate members, registrars, and the rural faculty, that is hospital and rural GP membership. So we're the largest specialist body in New Zealand. Um, we cover 90% of all GPs who work in New Zealand. Um, it speaks on behalf of its members, so it does a lot of advocacy. It represents the, their views, obviously, in the media and to central government. Um, but we're also very much into, obviously, quality of general practice and what actually happens in general practice and standards, but also, obviously, the training scheme itself and the postgraduate training scheme, the three-year training scheme, is a big, big part of what the college is responsible for and what it actually runs. So those sort of functions are key to what the college actually does. Um, specialising as a general practitioner, well, basically it's a vocational training program, much like registrar training programs in hospital, except it's based in the community. Um, it allows you to practice as a specialist general practitioner in New Zealand and to achieve fellowship of the College of GPs within Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, I think it's advantages, it's a flexible program. Um, so there is part-time options, which Stephen and I'm sure Melissa and Rachel will talk about. There's the opportunity for dual fellowship, that is fellowship in the College of uh, GPs, your fellowship in general practice, but also fellowships in, in rural medicine or, or, or hospital rural medicine. Um, and, you know, you can get into accelerated pathways if you have prior experience overseas or have achieved um, specialist training in another, another specialty. So all those things can be looked at. So what we thought we'd do, well, I'll kick off. Myself, um, May and Vanessa are going to talk about, I suppose, some basic questions just about why general practice, what's been the attraction, what's enjoyable about it, what actually happens on a typical day, and, and some of the odd things that may happen and why choose it. Um, I think this is a really good question. It's one I pondered as to why I chose general practice. And I, I suppose at one point in my career when I was, I was going through medical school, I was, I, was, I was thinking of psychiatry as an option and anaesthetics and um, just sort of got to the point where I didn't really want to get sort of too boxed into to one way of doing things and started to dabble in general practice. And what I found is, well, 
one thing that really suited my personality, I suppose. I really, really enjoyed the variety that general practice offered and some of the flexibility that was there as well. So my career was that I moved to Australia relatively soon after um, practicing. I worked in Sydney for a while and then it ended up working about four hours north of Adelaide in what was called the Mid-North um, Rural South Australia. So in a lead smelter town, it was a town of about 11, 12,000 people. Um, it had a district-based hospital. It had eight general practitioners in the town who actually did all the hospital-based medicine plus the general practice-based medicine. And it was a fantastic, fantastic nine years of our life. Owned a practice there, was able to get into practice ownership, completed my fellowship actually in Australia in both rural and remote medicine and general practice, and learned most of my hands-on um, medicine, I suppose, being there with a huge variety in terms of what went on and what happened. Came back to New Zealand, ended up working at Pora Union and Community Health Services, which is in Hannes Creek, East Pororua, which is 90% high needs, Māori, mainly Māori, Pacific and refugee. And again, have really enjoyed my time there working in a community trust, in a high needs community, but not only my own practice in this stage of my career. But general practice allowed me flexibility to do other things. So I've been sort of deputy medical director at Pharmac. I'm now medical director of the college. I've been able to do some academic work as well. I have run a sort of consultancy. So I've had, had a broad range of things which have been really interested, including teaching and teaching registers, which is something I've really enjoyed. I think the, for me, general practice is one of the things I've commented on, and they ask about what's the craziest things that happen in your career. I think that's slightly the wrong way to look about it. When you become good as a general practitioner, common, you get good at, I suppose, common things. Common things that walk through the door you get very proficient at, you get very good at, and it's based on the patients that you see or deal with. However, unusual things happen occasionally, and you've always got to be look out for it. And I always remember one guy in Port Perry, who was an elderly guy. He was Italian, at the age of about 75, and he presented with all these odd, odd symptoms. He had these neurological leg symptoms. He had slight cognitive dysfunction that came and went, um, he had this fatigue thing going on, this cluster of things that was really, really hard to put together. In the end, didn't quite know what to do with them, but because I was in lead smelter town, decided to do a lead level, and sure enough, the lead level was through the roof, and he was actually suffering from lead poisoning. And so, you know, you think you nailed it, that he's got lead poisoning because the lead smelters caused the poisoning, but actually what it turned out to be him being Italian, they like to make their own wine and he grew his own grapes out the back of his place and made his wine once a year. But what he was using to store his wine was a lead-lined casket from the turn of last century. So he had actually lead poisoning from his winemaking endeavours. So it, general practice is really interesting like that because you come across unusual things, which, 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 which are really, really fascinating. And as I said, you get good at a broad range of other things that are that are really neat. What 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 do I really like about it? I actually like the patients. I like my own patient base. I like knowing them. I like the knowing their far now. I know their history, what's happening, what's going on. I like the fact that a patient can walk into me as they did today and with 30 seconds you can tell there's actually something wrong. And you can just open up the conversation and start to talk about things. And that's really, really gratifying. I think variety, you never know what's going to walk through the door, the problems you're going to be faced with. And I think that's a huge benefit for general practice. There is an absolute flexibility in terms of what you do from teaching to academic to other roles in either management or, 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 or whatever happens to be practice ownership, working in community trust. You can actually work in rural sectors. You can actually do whatever you, you like. And, and, and I think the final thing for me is the medicine. The medicine is really important. It's really interesting. And you do need to know yourself that stuff. It needs to underpin what you do every day with the challenges you're faced with. So, look, I think it's been a great career. It's certainly been a great career for me. I wouldn't choose to do anything else. Um, and I've, I've, I've really, really enjoyed it. And I seriously hope you consider it as a career going forward. So, look, I'm going to hand over to Vanessa next, who's... Um, who's a recently GP fellow up in Auckland, um, to talk about her experience. It'll be totally different to mine, which is great. Um, so, Vanessa, if you'd like to take over. 
Thank you, Brian. Malale, everyone. Um, my name is Benisi and I'm of Tongan descent. I'm a GP fellow, just recently um, received my fellowship, yay. Um, I'm also, a, I also have a fellowship in urgent care. I am based in central Auckland, Stoddard Road Medical Centre. I work three days a week and then I work one day a week at Mount Roskill Grammar School and then do the occasional sort of urgent care shifts as well. Um, I love, um, as as Brian mentioned, I love being able to work with, um, with youth. Um, in particular, I have a special interest for our Pacific people. So being of Pacific descent, I love being able to help our people as well. And with the health in inequities and things, like I just want to close off that, that gap and um, help make a difference. Um, in terms of why I chose general practice, well, to be honest, I didn't want to become a GP actually to start with. Initially, I was wanting to do OBS and gynae. So in the hospital, my house officer years after having done the run, I was, I just thought, no, this is definitely not for me. Um, so being a mother of three, it's really difficult to find time to spend with, with your kids, especially as a doctor. And I just knew that that wasn't going to be a future for me. Um, and the hospital's working long hours um, and the night shifts, the graveyard shifts, I, the shift work was just not going to work for me. And there was one time where I drove home after a like four day stretch of night shifts and I almost got into a car accident falling asleep behind my wheel. And so that was it. And I was like, that's it. I'm not going to do this again. <laughs> but to be honest, I didn't actually know about the GP college um, to start with, which is why um, I went into urgent care. So I started off by doing urgent care at first and, you know, and then I ended up just joining the program. Um, after having done urgent care though, I knew there was just something missing and I didn't have sort of the regular follow-up and I wasn't able to chase up my patients. So it, it's kind of like an ED setting and I didn't really want that. And I knew that there was just something missing. So then I inquired and um, about the GP college and I had a couple of friends that were part of the GP college and I thought this, this is definitely for me. So since doing GP, it really is what I have been wanting. Um, it's so flexible with my family. Um, I'm able to do a number of things. So not only am I doing my, my work, but I also am on social media and I use these platforms in order to reach out to our people, reach out to our community and youth in particular. Um, and I've also had the opportunity to be on a TV show as a presenter called The Checkup. So, and, and see, that, that's the beauty of GP. Like, I don't think I would have been able to do that if I was in the hospital. Like, being out in the community, you've got this flexibility. You've got this flexibility to choose whether you want to work full-time, whether you want to work part-time, um, whether you want to do special interests. And so other things that I'm interested in as well is I do um, some gynae, um, sort of lark contraceptions and other procedures out in the community. So you get, and I love doing hands-on things. and. And that's that's the joy of GP is the special interests and it's and there's a number of things like there's a whole heap of things um, that you can do and like governance as well. So I'm also part of the Pacific chapter and just again just being that voice. So that's actually allowed me to 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 reach out um, to the community to make those changes at a governance um, sort of level. Um, the other I, I've also I'm also part of the Pacific the sorry the GP register chapter. So I'm part of two chapters um, and, and, that's, and that's great as well. So just being able to support our GP registrars. So th there's all of that. And, and like Brian mentioned, all these other benefits um, as well. Um, what's the scariest or the craziest thing that's happened? Um, I spoke about this at, at the, in, in the last webinar, but I wanted to kind of change it a bit. I would say what's the most rewarding that I've seen. And just recently, and I wanted to share this because I this is, what I find most rewarding about GP is when you're able to make a difference. We're usually the first port of call, so patients come and see us first. I had this middle-aged man who came in, European descent. Um, he came in with these unusual headaches that have been going on for the past week. And then he had this uh, like sort of increasing confusion and just not himself. And when he, when he was walking downstairs, he just felt like this pressure in his head after having done his neuro neurological examination, everything seemed pretty unremarkable. Um, and he does have a past medical history of having grade four squamous cell carcinoma in his scalp, which was only about sort of four months prior. And just given that history, this unusual sort of 
new changes that he's experiencing that have come on suddenly, I I just I wasn't happy with him going home. The other thing was is he presented at 5:30 in the evening, which is like we're meant to close at six o'clock. And so it was it was like a lot to do, but I knew that I had to do something because something just in my gut, it just felt like something was not right. So anyways, I spoke to um, the neurologist on call. They said, look, just send him into hospital, get a CT scan. Turns out, unfortunately, he's got mets in the brain and pretty much it's spread everywhere. This patient came back to the clinic and he came back very grateful. So he thanked me for staying back late just to organize all of this. Had it not been picked up at the time, maybe things could have got, got worse. And now he's getting treatment for it as well. And I think that's one of the most rewarding, you know, actually being in the community, being that first put of call, picking up on these things and preventing patients from, you know, from dying or, you know, symptoms getting getting worse or leading to um to, to bad things. So I that's definitely one of one of one of many patients that I have seen really where you're like saving lives. And that's that's our purpose, right? That's our purpose as doctors is we want to be able to save lives. Um, Yes. So in terms of what do I enjoy the most? I would say everything, like everything that Brian's mentioned, like and everything that I've kind of been sort of discussing. I would say one of the most rewarding um, or like what I enjoy most is just the environment in the GP setting. Like in the hospital, you feel isolated and you're kind of on your own. You don't have this sort of team. Whereas in the community in your GP clinic, you've you've got a team and we always have these social events where we all get to know each other and we do things together. Um, and it's usually multidisciplinary. So we have a number of people working within the practice or just besides. So we've got the pharmacists, um, you've got physios, some people have physios, we've got um, hip, health coaches, and the nurses and your receptionists and everyone just gets along really well. And having that relationship with everyone um, is, is amazing, but not only a relationship within your, with, with your colleagues, but also a relationship with your patients. Um, and I just love being able to follow our patients through. I love working with our patients and seeing, um, and then their whole family and their whole whanau as well, and just following them up um, and just, just going on that journey with them is, is really rewarding. Um, it's also really exciting when they come in and you've got like children who draw these little pictures for you and they're like, I love you, Dr. Prescott. You know, the, these these little things that we get is just is just absolutely awesome. Um, and why should you choose this as a career path? Why wouldn't you? Like, honestly, there's so much to there's so much you can do being a GP um, and yeah, options are endless. Like whatever it is that you have a special interest in, you are very likely to be able to do that in the community. Like not only would you just do pure GP, seeing patients every day, you could subspecialize and do other things. So focus on skin, do gynae stuff, do women's, women's health specifically, um, work in a high school and do youth health, like what I'm doing, sexual health. There's a number of things that you can do um, in, in the community, anything that you have sort of special interest in. And the flexibility, so important, especially if you're a mother, it just works out well. And I'm able to go out and I'm able to be a coach for my daughter's netball team. I can go to their, their prize givings. I can go to the school whenever I need time off. Um, so yeah, it's really flexible. And basically you get to be the boss of what you want to do and how you want to run the way you are as a GP. So yeah, that's me. I Thanks, thanks very much, Vanessi. That was that was great. And I totally agree with your comment about the team and general practice. It's one of the things that I think is a real strength of general practice. And that ability to have people around with you can just chat and talk about things and and feel part of part of part of something that's actually making a difference in the community. So thanks very much for that. So we're going to move on to May David, who's GP registrar, GP at three said who moved from paediatrics to general practice to just give her views on why general practice and uh, why she feels it was a, hopefully a, a, a good choice. Uh, kia ora koutou, um, ki te taho taki mama no naitu hui nga te prou me te, te whakatuhia, uh, ki te taho taki papa no nui. Um, 
Kia ora, yeah, I did. I came to uh, GP in a roundabout way. Um, so I was a paediatric registrar. I'm 43 years old. I've got three children. Um, I was a paediatric registrar. I had had my second baby and I was exhausted. Um, and while I was happy with that baby, uh, my grandfather was dying of pancreatic cancer in the Bay of Plenty. So any opportunity I had, I was going down there. Um, to be honest, I felt very unsupported by my by the pediatric team because all they cared about was whether I showed up to my to my shifts. And I, you know, meanwhile my kuro's dying, who raised me in, in all Portuguese, by the way. Um, and I'm happy with my second baby. It was just like really horrible. Um, I had a friend, Marcia Walker, who actually sees my phenomena as well, who had constantly been asking me uh, to change to GP. But I love, I love pediatrics. I really did. Um, and it was, be- it felt very destiny like. So after my karawa died, um, I was still down home after the Tangihana and. I got a call from Marcia to ask if I would like to uh, do some relief work at her GP practice. And I was still on maternity leave at that stage. And I said, yes. And so after two weeks of working, I said, get me a job, Marcia. And I've never turned back. Um, it's been the best decision I've ever made. I've had my third baby since then, who's now five and at school. Uh, like Vanessa, you know, um, it was really hard with my first baby. I'd get home from shifts and it and she hadn't seen me for four days and she'd get up in the middle of the night to say hello. You know, it might really make your heart sink. Uh, changing to GP, I now work three and a half days, um, which is normal in GP land um, and a big part of that work-life balance, uh, which I never have in paediatrics, despite working half-time and job sharing. It's just, I, I was just constantly exhausted. Um, and it was funny, I suppose the biggest thing for me when I changed to GP is I really love knowing whanos and families and, and knowing them from, you know, their nannies who's like 80, 90 years old uh, to the babies that are on the way. Um, and that's something you don't get in any other specialty. And it, and it actually scares a lot of my colleagues in the hospital to think that you've got such a broad range to cover. Um, I still get my babies and one of the biggest things as a pediatric background is you know like it's so important to be caring for these children's whanau as well not just for the babies. Uh, I, I, far too often I just felt like the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff and now I get to be the one stopping them any, getting anywhere near the cliff which you know means so much to me. Um, I also strangely found out how much I enjoy male's health, which I never, <laughs> I never ever thought um, was even something I would enjoy. I, I think part of that is growing up with my kuro, um, having, I've got six brothers, we've got different parents, but we still got these a lot of brothers. So, you know, I didn't realize how much my understanding of, of men would help um, actually get my male patients in and come and get them to have regular follow-up and hopefully listen (laughs) but also part of that is me listening to them um so that's kind of answering like three questions in one really you know as I can't um emphasize more what Vanessa has already said about you can pretty much choose what you want to do if you've got an interest in gynae you can you can focus on the gynae if you've got an interest in skin cancer you can do that like it's so um, vast and unlimited into the potential of what you could choose to do. Governance is another really interesting thing. Um, One of the big things that came through from COVID is how amazing our primary care uh, physicians are and how much we've been a part of ensuring COVID is what it is today. Um, And, you know, I really admire our senior GPs and, and the role they played in, in that um, and, and the willingness for them to mentor and support you through your learning is, is, is so good. You know, it's been the first time I've never had to go and organize myself for a consultant to come and watch me um, and observe my practice. It's already um, done. We have in-practice visits and I really value them. They're scary because somebody's sitting in the room watching what you're doing, but it's such valuable learning to improve your practice. Um, 
the craziest thing oh there's all sorts of things <laughs> i think a gp anything anything really walks in the door and it's quite surprising um, because you might be the only person with a tertiary education as i am in my high needs clinic that they know personally sometimes they come in with the most random question to ask you um that's got nothing to do with their health and it's more like something to do with you know, a lawyer or something, and act, and I've gotten used to answering those questions because they're not sure where to go to. Usually, I am directing them to go somewhere, but it's quite unusual to feel like they've come in and asked me that question. Um, so that's probably the thing that throws me a little bit. I'm getting used to answering those questions. Uh, I suppose the biggest thing is really getting that connection. Um, which is important to me and as a Māori Pacifica woman is really being able to be myself and represent my and my way of practice, which is whakawhanaunga tanga, um, and really connecting with my patients on another level um, that I would never get to do in, in the hospital because they just come and gone. Um, so I hope that kind of answers the why choose it as a career and all of those things I I really feel like this is my place in the world this was what I was made for and I quite honestly had never felt like that um and throughout my medical career until I found GP um and it and it pretty much is you can tailor make it to be what you want now as the only other unusual thing is that for six of the nine years that I've been in GP I was not a trainee and um, most of that was because I was waiting for my kids to grow up a little bit and finish having babies um, going on the GP training has really you know our GP is an art, is an art form as far as I'm concerned um, trying to get all the information that we get in 15 minutes and provide a management uh, and examine and provide a management plan is this this and there's an art form to it and then you move on to the next patient start all over again um, so that's been the biggest thing that's made me want to be actually do the GP training um, and also you know like it's so you have to you feel like you have to know everything so the GP training's really provided a framework for me to focus my learning and actually feel not overwhelmed <laughs> by the amount of things you need to know in GP land um, I'm going to stop there I'm sure that's pretty much covered the broad range of a lot of the reasons why I love being a GP I just feel like that's what I was always meant to be Kelda Look, thank you, May. That was that was great, and um, I'm glad you brought up COVID. I, I think general practice and primary care played a huge role in COVID. It was incredibly rewarding to be part of that and to provide safety and guidance to our patients, who in many cases were really anxious about what was going on, how it was going on. I think that was really important. I think the other thing that really tapped into the the whole relationship trust aspect of what actually goes on in the wider Fano, and it's it's you. you you work with part of a longer journey with patients that often the 15 minutes is a snapshot, but it's a snapshot of a, of a relationship that, 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 that extends. And I, I think that's so, so important. So thank you. Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the things in that trust relationship, you know, I had you know, all the anti-vaxxers and how much they were influencing people's decision. In the end, you know, it was that relationship that I had with my patients that they, that was the only reason they decided to get, vaccinated and and thank god because when it came through uh what a difference it made you know i had to be very blunt and say if i'm really afraid you'll die and they trusted me and they went through and had the vaccination so yeah i i do feel very pri privileged to be in that kind of position all right hey, thank you babe. thank you um, so our next, next speaker is Stephen Lillis, who's a GP in Hamilton um, and clinical lead for the for the program. So uh, a bit about, I suppose, why you decided to be a GP, Stephen, but also some insights into the program and and I suppose what's involved and what it's about. Sure thing. <coughs> Kia ora tata, of course, Stephen Lillis. Uh, originally, I'm from Ireland, of all places, and I've been here in Aotearoa since I was 17 years of age. As long as I can remember, the only thing I ever wanted to do with my life was to be a doctor. That was from the age of about 
three or four years of age. So that's that's kind of interesting. I went through Auckland Medical School and I actually <laughs> really didn't like it. Uh, the, the the bit that got me were the assessments, the exams, and I found them sort of really odd and strange and difficult and not particularly good. Uh, so I got through there and did a year as a surgical registrar and looked at that as a career. And I thought, oh, this is just so cold. It really is. So without knowing much about general practice, signed up for the general practice training scheme. And it was about a month into it where I thought, this is good. This is where I belong. Uh, and and it's where I've been ever since. Although a little bit like May and Venisi and Brian, my career has taken some very interesting turns. Quite quickly after uh, I was a registrar, I got involved with item writing for one of the GP exams. And I thoroughly enjoyed that, which sounded really weird. And then I became chief examiner of that paper. Then I became chief examiner of all of the papers. Then I took over as censor examinations. And then I took over as chair of uh, education and assessment committee for the college. This is mm, 12, 14 years ago. Uh, and, and got heavily involved in all of the assessment things that were happening. And at the same time, the medical council came to me and said, Hey, look, we want to redo NZ Rex. Would you be interested? And I said, Oh, absolutely. So I've been for the last 15 years, I've been the examinations director for the NZ Rex exam. And then council said, Oh, we'd like you to be uh, council's medical advisor. So I've been doing that for about the same length of time. And um, Academically, I've got a reputation as being really, really good in the area of assessment and medical education, which is absolutely shocking because I hated the assessments when I was at medical school. Um, why is general practice for me? It feels very comfortable. One of the things that I look back on in my career is that if I've been doing anything else, I probably wouldn't have been able to do all the various things that I've done along the years. I did a, a master's through Otago of general practice and a PhD through Auckland. Um, uh, and I don't think I'd have been able to do anywhere near any of those things if I'd been doing anything else. What's the scariest thing that happened? So this is this goes back. This goes back to the days when GPs commonly did house visits. Actually, I still do the occasional house visit. I, I work three tenths at Student Health, and just occasionally, the circumstances you think, oh, I really need to go and see this person. Um, but this is probably about twenty years ago. Uh, so it was on a weekend. I was the house visit doctor on call for the local clinic, and. I got a phone call and we always used to triage the phone calls just to make sure you're not going to anything unexpected. And I got this history of, oh, you know, vague tummy pain, not feeling particularly well. And I thought, yeah, 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 that's fine. I'll go along. So I walked in the door and here was this guy of about 55 years of age, gray in the face, absolutely gray. I said, uh, where is your tummy pain? And he started pointing to the very upper part of his tummy onto his sternum. And I took his pulse and it was all over the show. And I was thinking, this guy is so close to having a heart attack. And there was two family members present. I had oxygen, I had some aspirin, and that's about all that I had. And I was thinking, as I was I put an urgent call through to the ambulance, you really need to get here fast. Because I was thinking, if this guy arrests, I am essentially by myself. But ambulance came, took him away, and I breathed a heavy sigh of relief. And um, what do I most enjoy? Uh, it's it's the people. It very much is. Um, it's um, even despite the fact that I work at Student Health, and and the fact that I only work twelve hours a week there, uh, I have. Uh, a group of patients that see me that I really, really enjoy seeing and who they clearly really enjoy seeing me. And it's it's quite remarkable when you see people through some very, very difficult times of their life. So student health, the most common thing that we see is is mental health issues. And by the time that they come to student health with their mental health issues, they're pretty serious. 
And it's absolutely fabulous to be alongside and help and guide somebody through what is an incredibly difficult part of their life and bring them through that into a place where they're far more comfortable. I, I just absolutely love it. Why choose it as a career path? For me, the job satisfaction of being a GP. On my clinic days, I drive off to my clinic thinking, yay, clinic day, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna enjoy myself today. Now, I, I know lots of docs up and down the country from the various bits of pieces of work that I do, and not many of them would be able to say that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the general practice training scheme. So, as you'll see on that little slide, yes, you do six year, you at medical school, you do a minimum of two years pre-vocational training. Actually, a lot of people do quite a lot more than that, which is, which is not a problem. It's actually quite good to get an, a, a, a view of what you like, what you don't like. And it's very difficult to do that unless you're actually in the job. And it took me a year of being a surgical registrar to figure out, no, nope, not for me. So if we'll just move to the next slide, the intro requirements. Yeah, New Zealand citizenship, a permanent regis, uh, residency. You need a registration in the general scope. You need at least two years experience, a couple of referees reports, which are fine, uh, and at least eight runs, including at least six compulsory runs. The, the, the reality is that when we look at the applications, there's a fair amount of people who've got a lot more than that. It's fine to come in with, with that, but you know, a, a lot of people have a, a, a considerably more experience than that. There are some recommended runs, and those are up there, cardiology, dermatology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and all of those are kind of based on seeing quite a wide variety of patients and a wide variety of illnesses. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good grounding. So what do you get in the first 12 months? You're in a very supervised position. Literally down the corridor is an experienced GP who is trained as an educator, who you can knock on the door and say, I have no idea what's going on here. And the, the reality is for lots and lots of people who go into general practice, as, as much as people might think that four years as a medical registrar is going to prepare them well for general practice, mm, it doesn't. And, and they find literally every second patient or every third patient, they're knocking on the door getting help. And that's absolutely fine. They're there to be there. And you get these Wednesdays, which are always, uh, Heap of fun. The Wednesdays is all the registrars for that region come together. There's some formal teaching. Somebody might come along and talk about dermatology. There's um, vignettes that you prepare. There's your practice experience that you talk about. And then there's a high focus on communication skills because communication skills are one, um, a way to keep yourself safe. And second of all, a way to make sure that you're actually enjoying what you do. If you've got really good communication with your patients, they're comfortable talking to you, you're comfortable talking to them, it really helps. There is a learning platform called Tiara, which is essentially the curriculum of general practice. And it's relatively detailed, you can't go down and, and, and cover absolutely everything, but it's relatively detailed. You do get uh, the exams of, at the end of the year, uh, but you are well versed by that stage by your tutors on the Wednesday and by your teachers in the practice as to how to approach these exams, how you should be studying, how you should be preparing, uh, there's mock exams to help you along your way towards that. So most of the registrars feel that they're actually rather well um, prepared for the exam. So what are the program costs? Uh, there's three employment options, college employed, practice employed or self-funded. 
uh, college employed means that you're an employee of the college. Uh, and as it says, the expenses associated with employment and training du during your GPEP one year will be paid for by the college. Practice employed says that a practice is actually funding you to sit the program and that d the college will not cover you for some of the expenses. You can, if you wish, although very few people do it, do the self-funded option, and that's quite expensive at $45,000 a year. After you successfully sit the general practice exam, so if you think about pass rates in the examinations, the clinical exam has about an 85% pass rate, which is you know, sizably better than many colleges, and yet is actually, I think, quite realistic. The written exam has slightly higher pass rate, but it's around about the same. So this is not like some of the, the part one exams, for example, for the College of Physicians, where the pass rates are around 30% or whatever. So much more realistic from that point of view. Uh, in the program structure for GPEP 2 and 3, um, yes, indeed, it's the responsibility of the registrar to find a, an appropriate place of employment in a practice that is going to meet the, the, the requirements of the college. And they're all uh, on the website that you can see and, and, and check. At the same time, you're going to get uh, on once a month, you'll have a peer group meeting and you also get an in-practice visit. So an in-practice visit is an experienced medical educator who will come to your practice and sit in watch you with four or five patients and then give you feedback as to how you're doing and how you can better shape your progress into the future. And that's 24 months. That's more detail. I could just move to the next slide. And you have the professional uh, development plan. You do a clinical audit. Uh, you get multi-source feedback, which all helps to shape your practice. And then at the end of all of that, you get to have your fellowship visit, which is a, uh, an experienced fellowship assessor who will come to your practice and do an assessment. They will sit in and watch you work, plus look at a whole bunch of, of other material. Excuse me. And what's the success rate from the fellowship visit? It's somewhere north of 90%. So, you know, the, the, a reasonable person approaching it in a reasonable way has a very good chance of success. Those who don't focus and take things a little bit for granted, they are the ones who don't do so well at the fellowship visit. There is the possibility if you're an internationally trained GP, you can find a way through the college processes that will recognize a lot of your prior learning. But that's not really a huge portion of the people that come through the fellowship pathway uh, at all. That's probably, I would think, literally two or three people per year. So not much more than that. So I'm going to leave it there, uh, but very happy to take questions uh, as to the structure of the program or what you're going to experience during it. So I'll, Brian, I'll hand back to you. Great. Hey, Phil, thanks. Thanks for that overview, Stephen. That was really comprehensive and uh, gave insight into the program itself. So I think it's really timely hand over to, to Melissa Austin, who's a GP registrar, who's four weeks out from in the fellowship. I'm pleased to hear that I need to see past the pink to this day. <laughs> I appreciate it. The G GP up in Wellington and in, in, in Troy. And um, so I suppose uh, to give her impressions of general practice and her 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 um view uh, of general practice as a GP registrar, I suppose coming close to the end of her time over that three years. So Melissa, it's over to you. Oh, thank you. And um, yeah, kia ora everyone. So I'm now, I am, as Brian said, I'm a GP um, so in my final year of training and I am a PGY5 um, so I came into general practice 
as soon as I could um, at the end of my PGY2. Um, I kind of always knew I wanted to do it really. Um, I had some really phenomenal um, GP placements as a medical student um, down in the South Island. Uh, and my final GP placement in my TI year was um, at a practice in Wanaka and uh, my supervisor who I'm you know within five minutes of meeting her she she kind of said hey look what do you think about this mole nice to meet you by the way what do you think about this mole on my arm we had a look at it we said oh could be dodgy not too sure and she was like right sweet well block off your appointment you're whipping that out for me and within 10 minutes of meeting her I was cutting this mole out of her arm <laughs> and that kind of Switched it for me, really. I was like, absolutely, this is the practice I need to be in. This is the, the specialty for me. Um, and I kind of went into the hospital looking for anything that might deter me, I suppose, from, um, from general practice. And I, I really didn't find it. So I applied as soon as I could. I thought, why wait? Let's get into it. Um, so I did a, a kind of range of, um, of different specialties. Um, so I did some ED, I did psych, um, older person's health, general medicine, general surgery, those sorts of things. Um, I didn't do any PEDS or ONG um, prior to applying for general practice, which probably would have been nice to have, but actually was something that I've learned a lot about on the way. Um, and, and I'm now in a position where I'm comfortable with doing things like IUDs and PIPALs and that sort of thing. So it's all skills that I've managed to pick up over the past three years. Um, I think what I'm enjoying the most, so one of the things that actually I, I probably didn't even envision being an option for me when I applied for general practice and kind of got into to general practice training was the opportunity to be involved with setting up a, a new practice, actually. Um, and part of the work that I do, um, initially I worked at a youth one-stop shop, which is a, a, a kind of free, not-for-profit um, healthcare service based in Wellington. Um, and I was asked if I wanted to come on board to help set up a very similar kind of uh, service that based out of Porirua. Um, and I jumped at it really. And, and that kind of involved an opportunity to look through how is this practice going to run? How are we going to staff it? What's it going to look like? What services are we going to offer? Um, and that's actually been open for almost a year now um, out of Porirua. And um, 80 to 90 percent of our patients, um, age 10 to 24, um, Marine Pacific and it's just been a really phenomenal experience and actually one that I, as I say, couldn't have even really imagined um, imagined doing. I think probably one of the craziest things is cutting the mole out of my supervisor's arm within 10 minutes of meeting her. Um, why choose it as a career path? I mean, I kind of talked about exactly what Vanessa said, really. Why wouldn't you? Um, it's it's just awesome. And I think the the things that you get in terms of the opportunity to, to learn new skills the flexibility it brings in terms of how you work, where you work, what that looks like. Um, one of the things that I think has been really big for me is the kind of flat hierarchy in general practice as well um, that I really valued after my time in the hospital. It, you know, we're all doing a very similar job and we all, you know, even in my first year as a, as a training GP, I would have much more senior GPs come and ask my opinion on something. What did I think they should do in this situation? So it was just really cool and you feel really valued and, and, and a great member of the team. Um, and that's something that, that was so different and, and as I say, really valued as part of being, um, being in the general practice program. Um, so I think I'll talk a little bit more about what it actually looks like in a bit more detail um, coming from someone who's kind of just about finished the process. So from a GP1, now this is your first training year. So this is a really, as has already been said, this is a really closely supported uh, opportunity to kind of absorb and learn all things general practice. And what your structure kind of looks like. So your daily structure, this is assuming that you work full time. Um, you will do four days a week based in your clinic and you're going to do two six month rotations similar to other registrar placements one in a kind of more urban setting and one in either a kind of rural or high needs clinic. When you're in the clinic, you're going to see a certain number of patients and generally you'll start slow and you'll start with longer appointment times. And then as you get more comfortable, you will kind of build those up. So most people will start with, a, with 30 minute appointments to see patients. And, and that's, that's pretty comfortable as you kind of get into things and get comfortable with how it all works. As you feel more confident, you can drop that down 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 
But one of the things I really valued about, about my GPEG one year was that there wasn't any pressure to do that. And it was when I felt comfortable, when I felt ready. I guess one of the things that kind of uh, hijacked my GPEG one year as well was that that was 2020. Um, and so that was the year of COVID, uh, as I'm sure you all know. Um, and so that was quite an interesting experience to be a part of um, as my first real experience of general practice. But I think one of the things that was so awesome was that although patient numbers were dropping, we had the opportunity to do things like setting up you know, community-based assessment centres and how are we going to make this work with COVID? What are we going to do? How are we going to protect our community? Um, and, and that was just something, I guess, additional that was that was really good. But the point of me telling you that was that by the end of my, my session of my six months, I was still doing 30-minute appointments and that was fine because I just hadn't seen as many patients as I ordinarily would with COVID kind of taking over things a little. The other thing that's really important with your daily structure is that, as Stephen said, you've got a supervisor there the whole time. Um, and they are really senior GP and happy to be asked about anything. And that was one of the things my supervisor was really clear on. Even if it's every patient I'm asking them about, that is fine. That's what they're there for. They are happy to help. Um, so you're really, really well, well supported. And I feel like I can't really emphasize that enough. Um, from a weekly structure, so as I said, you'll do four days a week kind of contact time in the clinic. And then you have the seminar days as well. And the seminar days are essentially once a week all of the registrars in your region will get together. It's based on things like teaching um, opportunities, as Stephen said, for communication skills, building on that, working through that. But actually what it's also about is having an opportunity to catch up and to debrief and to support each other and, and talk about the challenging things that you're seeing and how are you processing that and how is that all going. So it's a really nice source of support as well. Um, generally at those seminar days you will do quite a bit of things like role plays and those sorts of things which are those things we kind of love to hate really um, I was told that by the end of GP1 I would come to love role plays I don't know if that's true but you definitely see the value in them and you see how they help to uh, improve your practice I suppose and be comfortable with that so you'll, you'll be fine um, this is just a kind of general overview of the kind of leave and things that you can expect as a college employed GPEG one. So as you can see, lots of support there, lots of opportunities for leave, you, you know, special kind of attention to things like you get the study leave to support you with your exams, a really good amount of annual leave and sick leave as well. And you have support to attend things like um, CME, college conference, those sorts of things as well. Um, so I won't kind of talk to those too much I feel like it's all really there the other thing I think and this is something I'm really keen to talk about because it, it's one of the kind of highlights of, of the lifestyle balance that comes with GP is talking a bit about what after hours work is, is required as part of GP one so what you need to do is, is five sessions per attachment and when I say attachment I'm talking a six month uh, placement and so we're talking five sessions and those sessions are three to four hours each so as you can see it's very manageable and, and quite different to the after hours expectation you can you can come to expect from working in the hospital. Now, when I did GP1, these sessions needed to be in a in like an acute care, like an urgent care setting. Um, but they can actually now just be um, acute, seeing acute patients in your own clinic, um, things like seeing respiratory patients, walk-in patients, doing an acute setting after hours as well, all counts. So it's quite flexible in that space too. Um, similar idea, you will always have a, a, super, a supervisor on site, an experienced GP that answer any questions. Um, and actually the time that you do uh, is after hours work, you can claim as leave and take it off from your kind of normal day-to-day um, -day week as well. So really, really flexible and, and well supported. Cool. Thank you. Um, awesome. So look, just a little bit to touch on in terms of kind of assignments and things that you can expect during that first year um, of GP training. Essentially, I think, you know, nothing is too burdensome, I don't think. I think it's all very manageable. Um, and a lot of it is, as kind of, again, Stephen alluded to, a lot of it is about communication skills and building on that as well. So you'll have four kind of one-page assignments. And really what those look like is summaries of cases you've seen, more in-depth kind of literature reviews of, of you know, um, conditions or presentations that you've had, those sorts of things. And generally, you'll kind of bring them to your seminar days and you might discuss them with your, with your other kind of classmates as well. You do have to do a number of video consults. So yes, that is fully videoing you doing your consults with the patient. And yes, that will be looked at at your seminar days as well. But everybody has to do it. It is useful. 
you will take some really good learning from it. And there are things that you'll see on the video that you're like, wow, I never knew I did that. So there is actually some really valuable learning that comes from that too. And everyone has to do it. Um, one of the things you get to do is a feedback questionnaire from your patients. Um, so that's an opportunity for patients after you've had a consult with them to some feedback, funnily enough. And, and that's kind of about what did they enjoy? What did they think that, you know, how confident were they in you? What did they think you could improve on? Those sorts of things. Again, really valuable um, and kind of highlights things that, that potentially you may not have even thought of really. Um, there's an audit that you can do, um, which is pretty straightforward um, and your, your practice can help guide you for that as well. Um, we've talked about the after hours, the IPVs, the in-practice visits have been discussed a little bit as well, but that's a kind of half day where a senior GP will come and watch you do your consultations. Again, nerve wracking, yes, no denying that, but um, really valuable, really helpful to kind of get that feedback from experienced GPs about this is what you do really well, this is what you could work on. And it's all done in such a supportive environment that, that it feels quite empowering actually by the end of it. Um, and then the only other thing to mention is just the community visits. So you have an opportunity in your GPEP one year to take a half day uh, every now and then to get out there and see what kind of services are available in the community. What will your patients come across? What sort of things do your patients interact with? And how does that link in with how you practice? So I guess for an example, I, um, I spent a day with Māori Women's Refuge in Porirua as one of my community visits. And that was, that was amazing, actually. We got to work through how do we do you know, acute assessments when people walk in, what kind of things can we expect to do? How can we support that person? What does that look like? Um, so it's things like that that can just be really, really valuable. And, and I have, um, I still have the, uh, the, the top dog um, at Māori Women's Refuge. I have her cell phone number on my phone and I often will just call her if I need her when I'm doing my workout in Porirua. So it's really, really useful and really helpful for building those connections as well. Um, Perfect. So preparation, I feel like I might get shocked saying this, but I don't feel like you necessarily need to do preparation because as I mean, saying Stephen kind of said, you can have years of experience and then come to GP and be like, oh my gosh, I'm quite sure about this. Um, so I think actually you're in such a supported year in your first year of GP training that you have the opportunity to learn stuff. And it's completely fine if you don't know the answer to things. No one expects you to know the answer to everything. You have that support available. You have health pathways. You have guidelines. You can always ask for help. And I think the other thing was, was I was quite surprised, even in my short amount of experience that I'd had prior to doing GP training, just how much had kind of come rushing back from med school and things I'd seen in, in the hospital as well. Um, so you'll be fine. You don't need to kind of panic about doing lots of study and research prior to starting. You'll be totally fine. Just get into it. Um, Next slide, thank you. Exams, yes. So you'll have a combination. Um, so there's the, the mock exams, which have already kind of been talked about. It's a little bit earlier in the year, about, about two or three months prior to the actual ones. Um, and then you've got a, you've got written exam and, and OSCE as well. And so the OSCE, very similar in nature to your kind of fifth year exam, 10 stations, you walk through them all um, with actors and an assessor in the room. And it's generally a kind of combination of examination or explanation of a station or how would you manage the situation um, if you were doing that. Um, we, when I did GPIP one, we had a study group and we started studying about three months out. Jury's out, whether maybe you might need a little bit longer than that, I'm not sure. We thought it was okay, Brian feels like maybe a bit longer. Um, <laughs> the point is, you'll be great, you'll be fine. Um, it's, it's nothing like the kind of, you know, I've got friends who've just been through the physician exams and people start studying a year out and things, and it's nothing like that. Um, you can certainly you can certainly work through this in a much shorter time frame. So um, exams are always stressful, but I think as far as things go, this is a relatively kind one. Perfect. And then kind of after GP1, so what does that always look like or what is that going to look like? So... You're right, yet yeah, you do need to um, negotiate your own contract and find your own um, place to work. Lots of people will go back to the places that they were at as a GP1. You don't have to do this, though. You can go wherever you want to, as long as it's kind of an approved practice to host a GP registrar. Um, and you have the opportunity to kind of negotiate, actually, what are you looking for? What do you want to do? How do you want that to work? And there's lots of support from both older GPs, but also more senior GPs, the medical educators from your seminar days and things, they can help you kind of work through what this might look like. 
there's lots of options in terms of what your employment like look, might look like. You can be employed as an employee or you can have a locum role where you kind of contract your services and have a little bit more flexibility about what that looks like. Um, salaried, or you can get paid per kind of four hour session that you do, or you can kind of earn a, 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 a proportion of what you generate for the, for the practice. Those are all kind of options as well in terms of income. Essentially, there's a whole lot of options. There's something that will fit everyone have a look through what's available, talk to colleagues, talk to friends and, and figure out what kind of might work best for you. Um, and there's lots of other things that you can get involved with kind of once you're through the GP training, you know, the GP one year as well. Um, so, you know, we've heard lots from other people about other things that, that they're doing. Um, I've had the, the new clinic out in Porirua that I've had the opportunity of, of setting up. I do some work with the clinical governance group. So kind of reflecting on our practice, how can we improve this? What processes can we change? But really, the world's your oyster, to be honest. The, the, whatever you kind of want to do, you can certainly work towards doing that and you can start doing that from, from GP2 onwards, really. So just get into it. Um, I feel like closing statement, do it. I love it. As I, I feel like I totally took totally what you said, mate. It's the best decision I've ever made. I could not have made a better decision. I'm, I'm so pleased that I've done general practice and you should totally go for it. That's what I have to say. <laughs> And how do you go about it? <laughs> yeah, that, that becomes the next question. So, so Melissa, thank you for that. That was great. And that was a great overview of the the, the thing. And the first year is a is a great year and being yeah. involved in teaching. It's it's fantastic, both for the teachers and and actually for the registrars, actually. It's 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 a really, really good year. And and one thing I'll tap into asking for help. I mean, I've I've been doing it for a number of years. I think I'm reasonably competent most days. But still, most days I'll go on and ask and chat things with with GP colleagues or or the nurses or whatever, just about the issues that are there. So some some you learn, which is great. So I'm going to head over to Rachel Rogers, who's the College Manager for Admissions and Registrar Support, just to go through some of the mechanics of applying for the for the um, for the uh, GPS uh, scheme. Thanks, Ryan. So applications for the GPAP program open mid-February every year. Um, no set date yet, but it's usually about the second week. There, are, there is a $400 application fee, which is non-refundable, um, which is, we use that for administration. Oh, so what happens is there is an application form online you complete the application form, you're assessed against a rubric. If you meet all our criteria, tick all the boxes, um, we can accept, you know, you may be accepted straight into the program. If there is any questions we have about either, um, you know, the runs you've done or you know, just the experience that you've got, you may be asked to do an interview. So, um, and you can pass the interview and get selected into the program. So your applications are open in February. You're generally told around about June, July that you've been accepted onto the program. Um, at that point, we do a number of other things. We have to do a Zoom interview, which usually happens around September, October, with the medical, the local medical educator to determine what's the best practice for you. So if you're a college employed, we try and match you up with practice that's going to be the best for your learning needs. If you are practice employed, you've chosen your own practice, we'll work with, work with you to make sure that they actually meet the criteria as well. A few things you need to supply us, um, your copy of your passport or birth certificate, um, your most recent practicing certificate, most recent advanced cardio cardiac life support certificate, and medical indemnity insurance information. Um, one of the good news stories that's come out in the last month is uh, college employed registrars have had a pay rise, so they're now paid the same as uh, most practice employed <laughs> registrars and also the hospital DHB. Um, if you're a college employed, you're also entitled to probably adds up to probably about $11,000 worth of additional um, funding. So through, if you're a rural, in a rural attachment, we provide allowances, we provide um, some travel um, reimbursements, um, membership fees are covered, 
repay for your exams. If you're practice employed, you have to cover all of those things yourself or negotiate that with your practice. So it's just a little bit there about um, the rural practice attachment. So you can, if you relocate to a rural practice, you actually physically move house, um, we can fund up to about $3,000 for each relocation. Very nice. Um, Stephen's run through a little bit about the eligibility requirements. Um, one of the key things is you have to hold general registration or um, if you don't hold it at the, at the point of application, you must hold it by the time you start to get one. If you're not a New Zealand citizen or a permanent resident, uh, you may be eligible for work, health workforce funding. Um, we apply to the ministry on your behalf, and generally that's um, most, most people are accepted for that funding. Um, just go back a little bit. Um, in terms of the application, we ask um, your preferred region or you know, where you'd like to be placed, um, and ninety percent of the time we can we can place you in that region. Um, the thing you have to realise is some places, Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, are generally very highly sought after places. Um, not everybody who's accepted onto the program, in those, particularly in those areas, will get to be placed there. Um, we encourage people to go to the, the rural areas for a higher chance of getting a good placement. Great, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so just before, we've just gone a little bit over time, but there is a couple of questions in the Q&A which I'll just bring up to answer before we close off. Um, so, so from one attendee, what are you looking for in applicants? Um, I don't know, Stephen, if you want to, to perhaps answer that. Happily, happily do that. There's a range of things that are considered important. The first that I would emphasize is a strong awareness of the cultural history of Aotearoa and a strong understanding of matters of equity of outcome. So that usually comes through quite strongly in the applicants um, when they write their, their application. Second bit would be to look at a degree of scholarship. So if you've got a postgraduate qualification, hey, terrific. If you don't, look, that's not so much of a problem. Third bit would be to look at, for example, leadership positions, those sorts of things. Um, then becomes important to look at the referees' reports and looking at things like professionalism, teamwork, etc. One of the, the, the critical things around general practice is that teamwork becomes really fundamentally important. And if your referees' reports are looking at and commenting favorably on teamwork, then that becomes uh, quite a, a positive factor. But I would just reiterate issues of equity, tetirity, et cetera, fundamentally important. Great, thanks, Stephen. Look, just a follow-up question, which I might throw to you as well, Stephen, just for the other two that are there. Just a question about, is it possible to do a postgraduate diploma in travel medicine during our house officer years? So I don't know if you can answer, but you did talk about other, you know, sort of postgraduate diplomas or things that may add to, 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 to what goes on. Yes, well, if, if you can fit it into your PGY1, PGY2, well, absolutely. Um, and having a qualification of some sort would reflect well in your application. But um, my thinking is that PGY1 and PGY2 do tend to be rather busy. Great, thanks, Stephen. I might throw this next one over to Melissa. It was a question, where can I find a list of courses that count in GPEP2 as a 15-point paper? Yes, so mm. it's on the, there is on the college website, isn't there? There's It'll the be list. in the current regulations, which yeah. are on the website. Right, yes. so yeah. on the website. In the college website, there's a document, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, you can email us. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and another question for Rachel. Please, can you give a brief overview of paid parental leave options and how might this work with training? I probably can't give you a lot of the detail, um, but we have a lot of registrars who take maternity leave, parental leave during the program. Um, 
So it, it is manageable. Um, I don't really know the okay. detail. But, but I suppose yeah. it's something that if you had a question about that, you could just fire an email or a uh, contact with the college and I'll get back to you with an answer on that. We can chase that up and probably load it onto the website. Okay, thanks. That, that's the questions that are coming. So just to, 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 to summarise, I mean, look, I, I suppose some of the, the key things, themes that have really come out this evening, I mean, the, the aspect of autonomy in terms of work and what you do, um, more say about where you work and where you choose to work and where you ha ha want to work. Subspecialisation is becoming a big thing in general practitioner as, as has been tucked into and there's a, a lot of opportunities to do that. That whole multidisciplinary teamwork and that sense of community in the practice, range of employment options. There's a career pathway and there's a myriad of places you can end up in general practice as each of us, I think, has started to, to demonstrate in terms of where you do actually go. Look, generalism, I totally agree with this. It's a lifetime of learning and discovery. And the other point I'd make about generalism, I believe we work in a generalist medical system in New Zealand, and it's actually fundamental to actually what goes in terms of the, the, the health of what happens in Aotearoa or New Zealand. Um, that depth and breadth of clinical practice, that ability to develop special interests, as we've just talked about, and I've certainly got one in diabetes, working where I work, and that opportunity for clinical leadership it's it's really really important to think about that and gps or specialist gps as leaders in, in community medicine and i think that's really really important um look so thank you look i'd thank, like to thank Stephen, venisi uh, may melissa and rachel um for their insights into general practice i think it's been really really useful um thanks for sticking with it for the last hour um choose general practice it's a great career um, we can all attest to that and um, certainly the training program is designed to be both interesting, um, to give you the skills to be, be a, a very competent generalist, specialist general practitioner and set you up for your, your career paths as you move forward. So um, thank you very much.